Okay, hello and welcome to our webinar. We're delighted you could join us. This session is called Sustainable Investing, Meeting New Expectations. It's brought to you by Refinitiv and ESG Investor. I'm Chris Hall, I'm the founding editor and I'm the moderator for this discussion. We're hoping that this could be the most interesting and enjoyable 60 minutes of your day. If you're able to close the door, mute your alerts and uh, ignore other distractions in the home office or wherever you are, well-behaved pets are welcome. During this discussion, we're aiming to provide practical insights into how asset managers are adjusting their products, processes and value propositions to ensure they both comply with evolving sustainable finance regulations and meets the fast changing institutional client expectations. I'm very fortunate to be joined by a spectacularly well-informed panel of experts who all have deep knowledge of the core areas we will discuss today. Regulation, institutional client priorities, evolving fund management solutions, and the underlying inputs and processes on which they are built. Allow me to introduce the panel in alphabetical order. We have Kate Brett, who is Head of Responsible Investments in, in the UK for Mercer. We have, joining us from Hong Kong, Matt Chan, who's Head of um, Public Policy, Regulatory Affairs and Sustainable Finance at ISIFMA. Emily Homer is Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at JP Morgan Asset Management. And Elena Filipova is Global Head of ESG Proposition at Refinitiv. I'm also joined, as you can see, by Zach, the baby mallard, and his two friends over my left shoulder. That is not a still from uh, Jurassic Park. We will split this, uh, uh, structure this discussion into roughly 10 to 12, four, 10 to 12 minute sections, looking at regulation first. And then we will be followed by a question and answer session as time allows. We will break up our four sessions via a simple polling question to gauge the mood of the room on of the topics of the day. And after the after the number of Zooms you've had over the last 12 months, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail about housekeeping rules. I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with those, but please do choose the chat, use the chat function, and we'll try to use as many, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, at the end of the discussion. Now, what do we mean by these new expectations? As I was told this week by Rekha Unithan, co-head of, head of impact investing at Nuveen in this week's ESG Investor Big Interview, the, la the largest issues facing the world today are, the, are income inequality and climate change. These are systemic risks to our way of life and tackling them requires both public and private partnership. We saw, we saw some of that public sector commitments at Earth Day, uh, at the Earth Day Summit hosted by US President Joe Biden recently. Business leaders accept that they can no longer treat the negative impacts of growth on environment and society as externalities. They have a cost which must be measured and, ma and managed. Prompted by their clients, and by regulation, asset managers have committed to supporting and driving these changes in the wider economy. But the means to do so are not quite yet fully in place. Many asset managers are offering new and revised solutions, but to avoid accusations of greenwashing, they need to do a lot of work behind the scenes to deliver on new expectations about real world Im impact alongside risk adjusted returns. First, we, as mentioned, we're going to look at the kind of geopolitical regulatory uh, overview uh, backdrop for uh, for what asset managers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's start with the big picture. We know that mandatory, mandatory regulatory requirements for reporting and managing ESG risks are increasing for corporates and for financial institutions. We know that disparate frameworks for disclosure of sustainability performance are giving way to new global standards, adherence, adherence to which will be scrutinised by securities regulators and auditors. But this is not just a compliance or reporting issue. I'm going to ask uh, Elena to start. Speaking as a former uh, member of the EC's technical expert group, Elena, I wonder if you could uh, start us off by commenting perhaps on some of the kind of scientific drivers as well as the kind of policy and legislative changes that are, uh, that are driving uh, change for asset managers and their clients. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you for joining us today and, and thank you for having me for this interesting conversation. Um, 
I, yes, we are living in an extremely interesting time of a lot of changes. Um, and, and you already touched on um, uh, the key drivers, the landscape. I, I I'll probably summarize uh, into three main um, uh, shifts and fundamental changes that we're experiencing worldwide. The first is the acknowledgement and acceptance that climate and other ESG matters really present systematic financial risks. Um, so moving away from um, ESG is nice to have, it's, um, uh, it's, it's good for the environment and society to actually it is uh, a good business and it is important for sustaining financial resilience and performance as well. Uh, and, and this is not only driven by uh, the private sector, but actually more and more by the public sector as well. The second shift is really around uh, the emergence of standards and mandatory disclosure, and it's um, hitting the biggest challenge that the industry faces um, at, at present. Um, and the third is the paradigm shift away from servicing purely the needs of investors to servicing stakeholders at large and not at the expense of servicing and meeting the needs of the investors, rather understanding the complexities and the interdependencies and links between other stakeholders and uh, the implications on delivering financial performance. Um, EU um, really set a very ambitious agenda um, back in 2080 with the publication of the Action Plan on Sustainable Finance uh, that covers um, actions required to um, onboard and mobilize the full financial markets, all market participants in that journey towards creating a sustainable and carbon neutral economy. Um, and um, I, I think that, again, this is very important. Why, why did European regulators do that? It is, it is not only because um, it, it felt like the right thing to do, but rather it's because it is believed that that transformation to a more sustainable model and economy is a prerequisite. It's very essential for sustaining financial resilience and stability. So from an EU perspective, what we've seen recently is um, in, in the last couple of weeks, um, a lot of important new developments. We saw the publication of the first delegated act on, uh, on the EU taxonomy, specifically for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Um, just to take a step and remind our audience, what is the EU taxonomy? And in very simple terms, it's a classification schema that aims to identify economic activities that have a significant positive impact on different environmental objectives at present. And the expectation is that this will be broadened to social objectives and impacts as well. So the first part of this journey was to build, um, build that uh, taxonomy, that classification schema for climate objectives, which is science-based and looking at the core um, industry activities and econ econ economic activities that have that um, significant impact on climate mitigation, climate adaptation. Um, the other uh, development that we saw is around the publication of the um, NFRD recommendations or what they're called now the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And what's important to highlight is that elevation of ambition and expansion of scope to cover um, the, the mandatory reporting requirements on sustainability information to all publicly listed companies, as well as all large companies, even those that are privately listed. And that's feedback that um, European regulators received loudly from the market, uh, that uh, regulation to be impactful and successful, to be executed by asset managers and other financial institutions in an effective way, a prerequisite is that the data challenges are overcome and the data challenges to be overcome is to require mandatory reporting that's consistent and standardized by um, issuers at large. Um, we also saw the release of the um, requirements to include ESG into suitability tests that also has big implications for um, um, advisors. 
um, and uh, the, the uh, SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation that requires financial institutions to report on uh, the ESG uh, inclusion of their practices as well as uh, ESG metrics and adverse impacts of their products grouped into different categories. So there is a lot going on and a lot of um, detail um, that uh, is keeping the industry very busy. Um, and um, we at Trafinity are um, doing our best to, to help the industry navigate through this time of change and um, take grasp the opportunities rather than uh, get set back by, by the uncertainties in this time of change. A last comment on, on the US, because I think it's very important also to acknowledge that this is not an EU phenomenon by all means. It's a global phenomenon that we experience in all markets. Um, and um, although US has been slow to, to, um, to kind of onboarding this agenda and supporting uh, the market in um, understanding, factoring and managing better sustainability risks, we do see uh, the SEC and, and other financial market regulators moving towards um, ESG disclosure matters, understanding that uh, data is at the heart of, of the uh, problem right now um, and better standards and the uh, reporting is, is very important. Um, so we do see them understanding and increasingly uh, acknowledging their role to act on climate and ESG reporting. And we probably will see um, the SEC creating an ESG disclosure mandate. Um, so a, quick, a very quick run through many things. Yes, absolutely. So uh, uh, Europe taking the lead, uh, US with kind of renewed vigour, um, kind of uh, catching up, particularly in the kind of disclosure um, uh, arena. Um, but uh, when we kind of think of um, of uh, the uh, picture that uh, Matt is uh, uh, having to uh, describe for us in uh, Asia Pacific, it can potentially look even even more complex um, due to the kind of uh, different speeds and the different priorities across uh, major um, uh, jurisdictions uh, uh, across uh, uh, across that region, Matt. How would you, could you describe for us some of the kind of key developments around the region uh, relating to the evolving regulatory landscape for sustainable investment as, as you see it? Yeah, sure, Chris, and, and, and it's great to be here because um, it is always good to, to make sure that the voice of Asia gets um, included in these discussions because, you know, we are looking at a global issue. Um, and um, as we'll talk about later, um, so much of the investment needed for um, climate, for example, needs to actually go into, into Asia. I guess from our perspective, so we look after um, both buy side and sell side uh, institutions working in capital markets. And so I'll probably take a fairly broad uh, view. Um, obviously, everyone's been subject to the developments around um, NGFS and very much a focus on climate related risk, um, how that's feeding into prudential regulations, uh, how that's feeding into um, financial stability conversations, stress testing, et cetera. And then within different uh, regulators, amongst different regulators, uh, a greater focus on environmental risk management, so MAS in Singapore, um, HKMA, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think those developments are probably broad, but certainly it's, it's very much a focus um, of uh, regulators in the Asian region. A very large part of the discussion has also, and I know Eleanor touched on taxonomy and gave a great, gave a great overview in terms of you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about taxonomies, but it's it's really been a very important conversation for us uh, in Asia, um, in part because we absolutely put our, um, doff our hats off to, to Europe for taking a leadership um, position in terms of leading a lot of this um, conversation around climate and the need to reorientate the system. The challenge, of course, is making sure that when we look talk, talk about taxonomies um, is that we need there to be global coordination on, on taxonomies. And so that's been very much a large part of the conversation here in Asia. One is their coordination so that, you know, uh, we can have a harmonized taxonomy um, globally across regions, et cetera, because as I mentioned, we, we wanna be able to move capital um, from where the investors are, but we need to get it into different markets. And that, that often um, and very much will entail um, cross-border movement of capital. And so to the extent that you can actually define taxonomies that work across borders, um, then uh, that's what's required for this to be successful. So there's been a lot of conversations about uh, harmonization, as I mentioned. The other 
big thing for uh, Asia is, is making sure that there's recognition or an allowance for uh, transition. So in a region like uh, Asia Pacific, we've got some very mature markets, both from an economic development point of view, but also from a capital markets perspective, whether you're talking about um, Hong Kong or Singapore. But at the same time, we're also dealing with uh, emerging and developing markets. And so for those markets, it's really important for them to, to be able to uh, recognise um, transition pathways. So not just binary kinds of thinking in terms of um, uh, what's green and what's brown, but actually thinking about uh, and incentivizing and, rep and um, recognizing that, that um, some economies and some sectors in, in those uh, regions are going to have to take uh, certain paths. One, and two, how do, you, how do you measure for that? So maybe that's about having um, you know, the same targets at the end, but maybe different thresholds for uh, uh, different uh, economies. Or it actually could um, come down to actually having and allowing for different pathways. So maybe in some in, uh, developed markets, it may not be um, uh, acceptable to, to recognize natural gas. However, if you're looking at an uh, emerging market in Asia where they're, they're using coal-fired um, power plants, for them to move to natural gas might be a, a small increment in, in the right direction. So that's very much a, a conversation that's been taking uh, place in Asia. Of course, greenwashing has been a very big focus uh, of the regulatory community in Asia. Um, the same kinds of issues around the need for um, disclosure standards, um, focus on poor practices amongst corporates and the need to, to get that right. Um, but also there's been a focus in terms of financial product labeling. So making sure uh, financial products that are sold as green products or ESG products, um, that they, that they um, reflect harmonized standards. Maybe another um, thing that I'll talk about is um, around uh, fragmentation. So I've mentioned the need for harmonization in terms of uh, taxonomy. That's also um, reflected in the need for harmonization in terms of disclosure standards. We think it's really important not only to have, um, I, I guess, global standards in terms of what we uh, class as green or not, um, but, but between sectors um, and between uh, companies within each sector. And then from a financial services uh, perspective, also harmonization between, um, uh, I guess, requirements, um, categorizations that, that are used in financial regulation versus um, ESG, et cetera. And then the other focus, of course, has been in, in capacity building, um, uh, uh, particularly in Hong Kong, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, uh, the, the, uh, and, and also that dimension around competitiveness of different financial hubs. So Hong Kong, for example, sees itself as being a future sustainable and green financial hub. It's a gateway into China. China has a need for uh, capital to be invested. Um, and then you've got rival with Singapore, which is also um, seeking to be a, a, a green and sustainable hub as well. Thank you, Matt. I think we may well uh, come, come back to that issue of uh, capacity uh, building uh, later in the discussion. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, Obviously, asset managers clearly have a lot on their plate uh, from the kind of regulatory perspective, but of course, their, their institutional clients, um, institutional investors are uh, highly regulated entities uh, in their own right. Um, Emily, you work very closely with kind of pension funds and uh, uh, in, in, in insurance firms across uh, Europe and beyond. Um, what, what are the kind of, um, how, how does the regulatory landscape uh, uh, look to those uh, particular clients? Yeah, I mean, it, I think I can confirm um, that it has been a lot of hard work, um, both on the asset management side and also for, for the asset owners. Um, but what we are seeing now is is a, quite an exciting shift um, in the regulatory framework for insurance and pension funds, in that we're seeing a shift from really a compliance mentality to more of a, how does this actually implicate? Um, impact my portfolio and do I need to reposition and then that can lead to the real world impacts that the regulation is intending to have um, so it is um, positive. Um, what I would say is that whilst the EU has obviously had a lot of um, credit for being a climate leader in the UK we have in my opinion it has been leading in terms of the actual practicalities of implementing um, these regulations into investment portfolios. And we can see that on three separate fronts, um, looking at pension funds and insurance companies. Just starting with pension funds, um, in 2019, the UK regulator, the DWP, asked all pension funds um, to 
right in their invest to amend their investment objectives effectively to incorporate ESG risks with a specific focus on on climate risks. And at the time, that led to a lot of discussions with asset managers around what we were doing to to incorporate those risks in our portfolios. So it's much more of a understanding the risks, um, thinking about. Um, complying with what the regulation was setting out. Um, more recently, earlier this year, the DWP has actually set um, out guidelines, or, um, in fact, regulation for the largest pension funds to start reporting in line with um, TCFD from next year onwards. And that has caused a real shift um, in the mentality of um, pension funds in particular, um, who are now going to have to actually take ownership of a lot of that, that climate risk. and really scrutinize the numbers and think about whether they should be shifting portfolio positioning um, to mitigate some of these climate risks. Um, the second, uh, talking about then insurance um, companies, what we've seen there has been a real focus on um, climate stress testing, which um, Matt mentioned. And again, the PRA was relatively leading in that space in that they asked um, insurance companies um, to voluntarily stress test their portfolios for transition and physical risks from climate change in 2019. And again, that led to a number of discussions with clients one and in fact the bank of england just to sort of understand how you do that in practice it's a very complicated exercise but it did bring out some interesting findings about thinking beyond just the energy sector about the impacts of climate risk thinking about maybe even the agricultural sector um, and we we're going to see a lot more focus on that um, with the bank of england um, doing another stress test this year and from june onwards um, lots of other regulators globally also start starting to stress test institutional portfolios. Um, so certainly that's an area that we need to work on, um, but it will, I believe, um, lead to, to a lot of questions around um, portfolio changes. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make was on um, capital charges, which uh, as a portfolio manager for insurance um, and insurance mandates in particular, I'm acutely aware of. Um, and effectively, the discussion is um, whether the capital charges, which currently are applied based on um, for bonds, credit rating and duration, whether they should incorporate an element of how green an asset is. And actually work was done in 2019 um, by the European Insurance and Pension Regulator, EOPA. Um, and the conclusion of that analysis was that um, there wasn't enough um, sort of risk improve enough of a lower risk to actually justify a lower capital charge for those assets. Um, however, since 2019, there have been a number of developments. Um, we've seen obviously COVID, which um, it almost served as a live stress test um, to see what the impacts of um, ESG tilting a portfolio could have on, on returns. And broadly, it has been positive. Um, the other factor is we've seen um, the ECB and the Bank of England uh, both think about amending their own purchase pro QE purchase programs um, in order to uh, consider the greenness of an asset. And then lastly, the EU taxonomy, which now has at least set those parameters to define what's green and not green. Um, and so I personally think, you know, it's a contentious issue um, and it's a difficult thing for regulators to do. Um, but I personally think that there could be at some point a differentiation based on capital charges, um, which could have quite a significant impact, not just for insurance companies, um, but also for the market as a whole, as um, you could see some quite significant repricing on the back of any such move. Um, so in summary, you know, it is hard work, um, but hopefully it is, um, I, I, I am definitely starting to see it get to and the impact phase, um, which is obviously what we're all looking for. Thank you, Emily. Um, I, I guess um, to a certain extent, um, we are uh, already kind of uh, moving into the uh, uh, in, into the kind of second phase of the conversation about uh, about um, uh, client perspectives, uh, leading on very kind of naturally from um, uh, Emily's comments on. Uh, on the kind of regulatory framework for insurance funds, pension funds, and insurance funds, pension funds, and other types of uh, asset owner. But before we dive too deeply into um, uh, evolving kind of client ex expectations, let's just quickly pause for our um, first poll question. 
of the day, just to uh, break um, uh, break things up slightly. Uh, slightly Eurocentric uh, question in, in some respects, but uh, as, uh, as suggested, SFDR has pretty kind of uh, global extraterritorial um, uh, ramifications. So um, a sim simple uh, uh, question to uh, start with. Do we think that uh, SFDR will make a, a positive impact on the ability of institutional investors to invest um, sustainably? Uh, will it have a very positive in impact? Will it have a marginal impact? Or will it be, uh, or will its uh, uh, impact actually be potentially kind of negligible to, uh, to, to negative? Please um, uh, enter your responses um, now. We will pause just uh, for, for 10 or 15 minutes, but uh, to, 10 or 15 seconds rather, uh, to, uh, to uh, take uh, feedback. Um, and uh, we'll report back to you as soon as we get the results. Um, and as we do so, I will ask, um, uh, I will, I'll kind of ask um, Kate, oh no, Emily is back with us, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll return to the script. Um, you mentioned a lot of changes, a lot of things that uh, uh, that are new on the uh, on on the kind of plate of uh, institutional investors, um, and I just wonder um, how how do these kind of new new changes, uh, new kind of responsibilities uh, and kind of uh, priorities, how do they sit alongside the existing kind of uh, kind of priorities of um, of, of, of clients um, you know what, what what is the kind of you know full picture for, for, for them are they still kind of really kind of prioritizing uh, you know the the kind of you know their, their, their kind of core traditional responsibilities yeah it, it certainly is is a, a difficult one um, to, to manage and I would say that um, the conversations we've been having um, with insurance and pension uh, clients have been along three three themes and um, firstly is the regulate regulatory and risk management front um, the second is reputational and then the third one is portfolio implementation and how it works in practice and just talking through those um, three themes uh, in um, in a bit more detail. Um, so obviously, as I've just talked about, regulation is a key driver um, for the interest um, and uh, more in-depth uh, deep dives into ESG uh, for investment committees. Um, but also the fact is, is that over the past five years, we've seen a number of examples of where an ESG um, risk has led to a really significant market move um, in bond prices. Um, just thinking, naming two, Volkswagen was probably one of the first that really, um, uh, really shook the market. And then um, Valet Dam collapse, the Valet Dam collapse um, a couple of years ago is also, you know, also led to very significant movements. And so that led naturally to investment committees wanting to engage on uh, risk management and how we were managing these ESG risks. And therefore, I would say for 2018, 2019, we were talking a lot about ESG integration, how we were incorporating these risks. And that very much aligned with the core um, function of investment committees, you know, focusing on risk adjusted returns and ensuring um, that they were uh, within the, the, their, their objectives. Um, so it was relatively un uncontroversial to be having those conversations. Um, in the last two years, we've seen, we've seen an increasing shift towards um, reputational risks and getting a lot of questions in particular by insurance companies on what their competitors are doing. Um, so really trying to find out if they're lagging their peers um, and how they're approaching ESG. And that's led to a few more conversations about setting specific targets or having exclusions in, in portfolios. Um, in terms of exclusions, we've seen, an, there's always been exclusions in portfolios, but we have seen a shift from just being tobacco and maybe coal to trying to think about whether it's oil sands, um, other energy sector um, uh, exposure. Um, in terms of the targets being set, a few examples are ESG rating, uh, targeting a specific ESG rating, targeting a specific um, reduction in, in carbon emissions, or even targeting specific diversity metrics. Um, and then this is where it does 
um, slightly clash with that, um, you know, traditional objective of just risk adjusted returns, because you're suddenly introducing another objective into the portfolio management. Um, and so we spend a lot of um, time with investment committees discussing portfolio implementation and thinking about, you know, doing a lot of analysis on how this impacts return, um, total return, but also income. Um, thinking about how it impacts the investment universe that they're invested in and um, insurance uh, companies particularly are notorious for the amount of constraints they have so it's hard sometimes to add an additional constraint um, so we discuss that um, and then the other element is um, the transaction costs involved um, in moving from one um, one uh, portfolio to a, a more ESG friendly portfolio. Um, so these are all factors that, that we're working through. Um, and I, I can't claim that we have all the, the solutions. As I said earlier on, the um, return issue, I think, is um, looking relatively positive in terms of the, um, the conversations we're having there. We've done some analysis showing that um, the return impact isn't that significant. Um, if anything, for risk adjusted returns, it's positive. Um, and similarly for income. Um, and so these are the conversations that we're having um, at varying levels of degrees, um, you know, depending on the size of the client. Um, some might be still more in the risk management phase, but we are certainly seeing a lot more focus in investment committees um, on these topics. Mm -hmm. An increasing focus from, uh, from, from, from clients and, uh, and increasing opportunities to, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, Im improve their uh, kind of um, their, their ability to uh, um, to invest sustainably, according to our poll, which says that SFDR will have a very positive uh, impact, uh, according to fifty one percent of our um, uh, of our uh, uh, audience, and a marginal uh, um, uh, marginally positive uh, impact on. Uh, uh, on their ability to invest sustainably from 44%. Only a very small firm uh, uh, group think uh, the, um, the uh, impact will be um, negligible to, uh, to negative. So uh, that's, um, that's an interesting kind of lead on into um, Kate. Um, I, I, this is very much your kind of, uh, um, kind of home territory, I suppose, the kind of evolving uh, uh, needs and uh, perspectives of asset owners as you, uh, uh, you you talk to them as an investment consultant on a, on a, on a very kind of uh, uh, regular basis. How, how would you um, kind of describe the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the priorities of, uh, uh, of asset owners right now? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, and, and that's right, we work with a, a very broad range of asset owners so from, from very small pension funds, insurers, um, but also kind of charities and diamonds. So, so we see this very wide spectrum of, of how different asset owners are adapting to the, this very rapidly evolving kind of climate. Um, and I, I think just to, to sort of echo Emily's comments, we, we are seeing that this real focus move away just from a, a sort of risk management focus to this broader impact focus across our asset owner clients. And, and really a lot of our, our clients are starting to say, well, historically, I, I've, for example, looked at what's the impact of climate change on my portfolio, but increasingly looking to say, what is the impact of our investments on climate change and, and other sustainability issues as well? Um, so I think there's kind of three key sort of themes that, that we're seeing kind of driving asset owners at the moment. So, so the first is um, around really the, the, the focus on climate and really setting net, net zero commitments at, at an asset owner level to, to really drive um, setting those from a, a strategic perspective um, so marrying the, the, the kind of historically that the very top down sort of analysis um, asset owners have done to look at different climate change scenarios, the stress testing that, that, that Matthew mentioned as well, but, but really to look at, at the portfolios from, from a more bottom up perspective and, and say, well, where is my portfolio aligned to the transition and, and am I able to, to set a net zero target and, and what kind of um, interim steps do, do I need to achieve um, to, to be able to do that? So. But that's one of the, the, the sort of key areas of, of demand we're, we're sort of seeing from, from our client base. Um, the, the second one which, which ties into that is around stewardship. So again, uh, I think Matthew raised the, 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 the kind of issue that, um, yeah, it's not just about looking at where your portfolio is well aligned to, to solutions or um, perhaps as exposure from a, a risk perspective to the, the, the kind of grey assets or high carbon intensive assets, but how you actually steward 
um, either the assets or, the, or work with the asset managers to, to um, steward what's kind of in between to, to ensure it is on, on track for, for Paris alignment um, and, and use your, your voice as a, a large investor. And, and increasingly we're seeing um, the asset owners work, work together on that through um, different collaborative initiatives and, and again, um, very much globally. So, so we, we did a, a large project last year um, with the UK China Green Finance Centre around sharing best practice, for example, between the, the UK ESG leader asset owners and, and China's asset owners. And, and so there's really this um, recognition that, that it has to be collaborative um, to make change and, and stewardship. Again, we've seen from a regulatory perspective in the UK that the UK stewardship code, for example, um, move away from its focus on equities to, to other asset classes. And again, similarly for across our asset owner base, when it, it comes to ESG, I think it's fair to say that um, most of them have historically focused on integrating ESG into equities, perhaps because it's um, slightly easier and more obvious. And, and again, from a, a stewardship perspective and voting perspective, but increasingly recognizing that actually, yeah, fixed income managers are also very influential when, when companies come back to the market to, to raise debt. So, so using that, that voice um, across the portfolio. Um, Again, in terms of aligning to, to, to Paris or, or achieving these net zero commitments, there's an increasing focus on, on the solutions and opportunities. So, so less of a, a risk focus, but more of an opportunity set focus of how do I align my portfolio um, to, to these green solutions um, and carving out um, uh, kind of perhaps impact um, sort of asset, well, an allocation to, to kind of impact focus strategies as well. And then the, the sort of third trend that, that we're seeing is this, um, I guess that the last few years that the focus has very much been on the, the environmental, um, the, the, the sort of data disclosure, I, I guess has historically been better there, but increasingly this focus on, on social issues. So be that um, uh, kind of climate related as well in the sense of the, the just transition or biodiversity impacts, um, but also, I think partly as a, a result of COVID that there's been a focus on kind of workforce disclosure, how companies are, are managing the sort of workforce issues and, and modern slavery in particular is, is um, a key issue for, for many of our asset owner clients as well. So I think, um, yeah, in terms of where things are evolving and, and, and what we will continue to see is this um, definitely a, a focus on climate change, but probably a, a more holistic approach across the portfolio and how yeah, we can also integrate some of these social issues um, more greatly into the portfolio. Wow. So that's got uh, asset owners pushing forwards in on a lot of fronts, um, you, know, uh, you know, not just allocation, but engagement, not just equities, but fixed income and across asset classes and not just environment, but social and governance and, uh, and, and you know, digging into uh, uh, you know, looking under the uh, under the bonnet, so to speak, on a lot of different uh, topics. Um, uh, Elena, Refinitiv works with a lot of uh, you know, di different uh, elements of the, uh, uh, a lot of different types of kind of financial institutions. Are the kind of um, uh, comments on what uh, asset owners are, uh, are are kind of focusing on? Does that kind of you know resonate with uh, uh, with, with uh, what what you're seeing in terms of the kind of uh, the asset owners' expectations, uh, focuses, and uh, uh, needs on of uh, uh, relating to what they're expecting from their uh, asset management partners. Yes, um, I mean, what we're hearing from our customers is very similar to what um, the other panelists have already uh, spoken about and covered. There is surely an overwhelming demand for climate-related data solutions, um, analytics, um, and uh, that's quite also relevant by the dynamics in the market that we're observing across public and private uh, initiatives, uh, push for more disclosure, for assessing risks, managing them, and reporting on them. But um, as mentioned, over the last couple of years, we do see growing demand in other areas. Um, maybe worth mentioning the setup of the task force on nature-related uh, financial disclosure, similar to TCFT, the TNFT, um, and similar um, initiatives which really aim to accelerate the uh, debate and the maturity on our understanding around biodiversity. Um, we've also seen um, in the U.S. particularly um, an investor 
push towards uh, racial um, justice and uh, the need to um, ensure better um, accuracy of the information, the external audits. That's a team that also is quite um, frequently uh, referenced in um, EU regulatory texts as well. So the importance to um, uh, to validate information, audit it, um, to then uh, create better investor confidence and usability in the data and the related products, sustainability related products that then are launched to market. Um, and we saw BlackRock agreeing to um, have an external audit to its uh, diversity, equity and inclusion data starting next year um, and the impact that those initiatives have on their stakeholders. So we do see quite a lot of changes and, and usually when there is such fundamental change uh, coming into the market, there are the, the leaders the more mature um, asset managers, asset owners that showcase how to do it. And it's used as a blueprint uh, to then be implemented more broadly, as well as, of course, in a space like ESG, which is maturing, it's growing very fastly, but it's still in its infancy stage. There is a necessity for a lot of innovation and a lot of flexibility. Um, and that um, concept is, again, something that um, we see in the type of products that um, investors use and create the type of uh, benchmarks being launched uh, to support climate transition, for example, or Paris Align objectives. There is a lot of the, the, the uh, differentiation and diversity, and that's very healthy and very important to accelerate uh, this agenda forward. And of course, then, um, I think it's worth mentioning that the pandemic crisis is, is actually not helping uh, social um, injustice, but it's widening uh, decades long um, gender gap. So that will only create bigger social problems for our societies to, to deal with. And the sooner we uh, understand the interconnections and, and, um, and start uh, building that, that into our financial decision-making processes and solutions, the better it is. Um, and of course, the reevaluation of governance models is uh, a framework for then uh, how effectively institutions, companies, businesses manage the environmental and social risks is, is also on the agenda. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, a, a lot of uh, diversity and, and the growth in demand across different asset classes that uh, uh, Kate mentioned is, uh, is very important. Um, we've seen um, um, obviously not only a big jump in the issuance of green sustainable transition type um, bonds, um, but also in terms of infrastructure projects uh, there is a lot of um, a green infrastructure uh, that uh, is attracting uh, larger and larger capital inflows. And uh, it's to, to have the desired impact and shift at the broad uh, scale, we have to stop uh, looking at it from an equities perspective only. Most of the capital actually is in other asset classes. Understood. Thank you very much, Elena. So I'm going to ask, um, uh, I'm going to bring up our second poll question, really, because that very much reflects, um, you know, what we've uh, just been uh, hearing from uh, our panelists in terms of uh, uh, what are the kind of, uh, what, what are the kind of main drivers of um, asset owners uh, uh, interest in and focus on sustainable investing from the uh, comments that we've heard so far, it would appear that there's uh, that you know climate is important, but there's a real kind of uh, a mix of ESG factors, and, and that uh, a lot of asset owners are going well beyond uh, compliance. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to uh, to vote on uh, on uh, on that question now, and I'm going to ask Matt um, to uh, comment uh, on, on what he's seeing in uh, a, a across the APAC market. And I'm, I understand, Matt, that you feel that. Um, for the time being, there's a fairly kind of strong focus on on climate amongst uh, the institutional clients of uh, uh, of uh, asset managers. Is, is is that right? Yeah, we've been looking at um, uh, the issue of climate. Um, we actually produced a report um, through GFMA, our parent affiliate, uh, and it was done in um, partnership with BCG. And we were actually looking at climate finance. We were looking at the size of investment uh, required, um, and we estimated it to be a hundred. 
between 100 to 150 trillion US dollars over the next three decades, which translates, of course, um, to two to three trillion per year. And that's just to keep um, temperature rises between 1.5 degrees Celsius to, to two degrees Celsius. I think the big point that um, is worth noting there is that um, of that uh, 100 to 150 uh, trillion, 66 trillion um, was in, uh, needs to actually take place in, uh, be invested into Asia. And that's, that's, um, that just reflects population growth there, the rapid uh, urbanization uh, in Asia. And then, yeah, to, to hark back to, to some of the other points made, obviously there's a need to reorientate uh, the financial system. And that's something that we've been looking at in Asia. Um, I've talked about previously the, pre the, the different pathways that need to be recognized. Um, um, but I think more than anything is, is, is recognition that it has to happen across a multitude of asset classes. So I know um, some of us are talking about green bonds, some it's also uh, about equity. So moving, thinking differently between use of proceeds versus thinking at, at the entity level, um, but also the derivative space. Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so it was good to see that, uh, that the um, uh, responses to the, uh, the, the polls seem to be uh, it, broadly in line with uh, what uh, the experience of our, our, our panellists, with 58% uh, uh, of people seeing a kind of mix of ESG factors as driving uh, uh, the uh, priorities of institutional investors. So let, let, let's move uh, swiftly into... Um, the kind of third, third part of our, our discussion where we look even deeper at how asset managers are, are um, um, kind of responding to those uh, uh, new expectations of clients and of, uh, of regulators. And uh, Kate, could I start, start with, with you this time? Um, you know, a lot of you know, solutions and funds from asset managers have been launched or, or rebranded to account for a, a greater focus on sustainable investing. Um, but obviously you, you work uh, you know, with asset owners, selecting and working with asset managers. How do you, how do you see the response of, um, of a, asset managers to these uh, new expectations, you know, both in terms of the, the, you know, the, the, the fund solutions, the stewardship capabilities and, and perhaps beyond? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, so yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing a, a, a good response for, for managers. So, so there's a lot of, of partnership um, between the asset owners and managers in sort of developing new solutions. Um, um, so again, um, kind of extending existing mandates to, to say include green bonds as an example, or um, designing new sort of index-based solutions. And, and Elena touched on this with, with the sort of benchmarks. So, so we've seen a number of, of clients kind of work with managers, index providers to, to sort of develop very custom solutions around ESG. Um, so again, aligning with, with some of the EU regulatory requirements on sort of climate transition indices or Paris line benchmarks. Um, I think there's a greater focus for, for managers as well on, on sort of solutions that have a more targeted objective. So, so um, have an explicit objective to, to um, focus on energy transition, for example, and, and have a, a net zero commitment in its own right. Um, and a, a kind of focus on impact metrics or, or kind of um, a disclosure of additional sort of ESG monitoring metrics um, aligned with the taxonomy, but also aligned with, with um, bespoke client expectations as well, um, depending on their, their focus. Um, in terms of the, the resourcing, I think we have seen um, quite a step up in, in managers in terms of stewardship resourcing. Um, again, both from a, a personnel perspective, but, but also in terms of some of the, the data and te technology they're using, I think there's a recognition that clients are increasingly um, have expectations of bespoke reporting, bespoke requirements. Um, so, so one of the things we, we have also seen though, across the industry is working with managers and asset owners through um, uh, sort of some of the industry bodies, such as the, the PLSA, the, the Pensions and, and Lifetime Savings Association in the UK, to actually standardise some of those requests from, from clients to managers, because obviously we recognise that um, the, the more standardised that those kind of requests and that the data expectations can be, that the, the sort of better for the industry as a whole than, than managers having to, to kind of respond to, to lots of different um, or slightly different queries from, from lots of clients. So. I think that will continue to be a focus. And then I guess the other area that I think we're, when we're um, reviewing managers on, on behalf of clients, is a, a quite a great focus on diversity and inclusion of the, the managers themselves and, and how they use um, diversity in, in terms of 
teens, etc., to diversity of thought and, and how that's structured. So, so we're seeing quite a lot of focus from, from asset owners on that side as well when they're selecting a, a manager to partner with. How are they um, managing diversity with, within the, the, the management firm? So, yeah, I, I think we will continue to see a, a kind of focus on, on growth in resources, but I think it's about targeting the resources and, and integration of those resources as well. I, I think asset owners, we're not just expecting people to, to kind of grow huge teams, but it's about how the, those resources are used and how they're integrated into those portfolio management activities, which is actually key to, to getting the integration of the ESG into the, the, the sort of investment portfolios as the, the end result. Mm -hmm. So a positive response, uh, resources coming in, but uh, much more uh, work to do it would, uh, would, would appear. Um, um, Emily, um, obviously, um, you know, speaking from you know, you, you know, your own experience as a kind of a fixed income uh, portfolio manager, I know that you've been uh, working um, on uh, on on solutions so uh, that uh, responds to the kind of uh, issues that uh, uh, Kate was uh, describing in terms of uh, you know targeting explicit uh, objectives um, of of, of uh, institutional investors, perhaps. Um, um, perhaps you could uh, sh share a little bit more kind of detail in terms of you know how you've been going about that uh, in terms of you know you know responding and building new new, new solutions um, in in response to those uh, evolving expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we have uh, have been seeing this big shift from, uh, to the first point that Kate mentioned earlier on um, to investors wanting to set net zero targets um, and with uh, a large portion of the the assets um, that we manage for insurance and pension funds uh, being buy and maintain fixed income we've had to come up with a solution um, and a framework to effectively integrate those net zero targets alongside the existing objectives of um, stable income um, over a longer time period um, and I would say the nice thing about uh, buy maintain fixed income is that it fits very well with with the net zero target because you're and and the actual real world impact because because you're limited in the turnover that you can have in your portfolio you actually tend to um, have to engage with issuers in order to achieve the decarbonization that you're aiming for. So on day one, you're trying to buy issuers as much as possible that you think are going to be able, are committed to net zero themselves and have solutions in place. But a huge part of that is actually the engagement um, with issuers and helping them set the appropriate targets and evaluate whether they're realistic um, and whether they're spending enough resources on achieving those targets. Um, so a lot about, um, you know, a lot of process is on, on that engagement. And one interesting feature of fixed income that we've been using um, for that um, is maturities. We get a lot of questions about, well, how do I, um, you know, how do you know if I'm in a buy and maintain portfolio, how can I ensure that I'm not get, incurring having to force sale um, when you realize that the targets are actually not achievable? Um, and so what we, we've been doing is using maturities as a um, sort of a time frame for our engagement. So thinking that in a sector like utilities, um, where we do have a reasonably clear pathway to net zero um, and a lot of the companies in there are committing serious resources to achieve um, their, the targets that they're setting out. We might be comfortable for a long duration mandate buying a 30 year maturity bond. But for a sector like cement, um, where we're still a bit unclear as a sector how to achieve net zero and whether all the technologies are, are in place and also companies within the cement sector um, are at are you know, at varying levels of degrees in terms of their commitment. And um, we might buy a five-year bond and engage with um, that, um, that issuer over the next five years. And as Kate said, really use our power as bondholders to actually refinance a firm to increase um, the cost of capital for them if, if they're not achieving the targets. Um, so I think that is um, why, as Elena said, it is very important um, to engage fixed income investors as well, because it is, you know, we do have a huge power in terms of actually keeping issuers um, going, um, and even more so in, in um, asset classes like high yield, um, where we can be very powerful um, when it com comes to, to refinancing. 
Yes, a, a very in, in, interesting kind of crossover there in uh, in in um, in uh, th those comments between the kind of the stewardship and the uh, allocation angle and kind of all, uh, kind of working in 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 sync there, which is uh, interesting. And perhaps there'll uh, there'll there'll be kind of more of that in the in, in the future. Um, we'll, we'll we'll turn now uh, to a, a little bit more into the kind of uh, data and processes um, uh, underlying some of the uh, the, the new. Uh, kind of solutions and approaches being taken by uh, asset managers, and we'll we'll go there by way of the uh, third and final poll question, um, which is really around um, what do we feel are the kind of uh, biggest um, sustainable in investing uh, challenges for us asset, ma asset managers in terms of their kind of you know their in internal kind of capabilities and their uh, their ability to respond. Is it is a focus on on skills? Is it is, is data the biggest challenge, or is it simply the kind of you know the the, the pace of change in this kind of uh, uh, environment at the moment? And as we wait for um, uh, uh, kind of uh, everyone to uh, kind of make up their minds and uh, uh, and respond to the uh, uh, to that that question, I'd like to ask um, uh, Elena um, what what you're seeing in terms of the uh, the, the kind of data related uh, challenges facing asset managers as they try to uh, you know identify the kind of uh, you know risks and uh, opportunities uh, we you know we talked about uh, several times how important kind of social uh, factors are alongside environmental ones but they can be very difficult to get hold of the right uh, the, the, the right data how, how what, what are the kind of you know data issues data governance data models that uh, that are, are going to kind of help asset managers? And I, I hope my comments don't uh, influence the answers of our audience on the third poll question. From my experience in, in working not only with uh, many asset managers, uh, but also on different types of industry-wide initiatives to look into, into data problems to really enable the industry to understand the risks and opportunities um, created for um, uh, for investors uh, because of the, the change. It is not necessarily, uh, uh, the data challenges are not at the heart of the problem because there is a lot of data once you start looking at it. It's about education, it's about knowledge and understanding how to utilize the data. So I lean more towards it's the skills problem than actual data problem. Um, and that's evident also if, if you compare the actual processes execution um, and developments happening in some asset managers that have been on the sustainability journey for years, for decades even, versus others that are embarking on now. You see a huge uh, skill set knowledge gap that hurts the ability to implement um, and design not only the right solutions, the right processes and, and products, but really um, uh, start asking the right questions. So the reluctance to even uh, get your feet wet um, is, is uh, what, what's, what's happening. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about uh, the different dynamics in the market and many are aiming towards improving data availability and transparency. But in my opinion, not enough is um, aiming at learning education and improving the skills that the industry needs to start understanding this new um, sea of, of information that's uh, flooding us, flooding all of us. There is a lot of data out there. And um, we as a data provider, and so are our peers as well in the industry, are spending a lot of time in synthesizing, digesting, standardizing, connecting the data and presenting it in a very simple uh, package to our customers so that it's intuitive and it speaks the language that financial professionals speak to then um, integrate it effectively in, into their processes. I guess the analogy with an iPhone here makes sense where there is a lot of complexity behind an iPhone, but then when you start using it, it's very intuitive, very simple. That's the challenge that uh, we as data providers face with ESG data. But in terms of governance models and, and the role that technology plays, I think it's important not to look for asset managers, not to look at ESG as a separate beast it's, it's a data set. 
like any other data set that they manage internally, whether that's market data, financial data, and, and anything, any, any other data sets. Um, so although it speaks a very different language at this point in time, it is a data set that needs to be managed similarly to, to others. And we saw the CSRD recommendation, which came out um, two weeks ago, uh, is requiring and talking about not only audits, but also digitally tagging the data and the documents to make them uh, more digestible, more if to bring more effectiveness to the uh, full value chain and uh, quicker uh, ingestion of the data into downstream products and reaching end users. Um, so a lot of momentum, innovation, I spoke about innovation already, but I think that ESG as a data set has the potential to be um, more innovative than some of the other traditional data sets um, and, and will be leading, leading the pack. It's very interesting to hear uh... Um, that um, that it, it is perhaps kind of skills as much as uh, if not more so than uh, uh, the, than data that is the kind of uh, kind of you know big, big challenge perhaps for facing athletic managers. Uh, Matt, um, I, I certainly know that I've read from the kind of CFA Institute survey that they've said similar things. They've they've identified a kind of uh, uh, skill, skills uh, as a kind of key, key challenge for the asset management industry facing sustainable in, in investment. Um, you mentioned earlier kind of capacity uh, capacity building uh, as, as a kind of challenge. Now, uh, before I uh, um, uh, uh, ask you to uh, answer, I should just point out to everyone that we are kind of ru running over a, a tiny bit now. It's uh, it, where our hour is up. So we'll we'll wrap up in the next five minutes. Uh, but um, I'd like to get uh, kind of final comments in from uh, Emily and, uh, uh, and uh, Kate, if I possibly can, uh, after hearing from you, Matt. Yeah, sure. And I'll be as quick as I can. Absolutely. Um, it is something that's been focused on. We did look at um, data challenges in Asia and, and, and many of those resonated with, with some of the comments from Eleanor. But yeah, um, one of the big things that we saw is a need for um, capacity building around data. Um, and that's probably generic data skills. So thinking about kind of analytical skills, interpretation skills, but probably also, and I actually, I think Eleanor might, may have touched upon this, but what we would call pre-analysis skills. So Kind of the data gathering, um, but also the trans transformation and processing and storage. So that was something that was really identified as an issue. Um, but then I think also what's important is kind of uh, understanding adjacent knowledge areas and disciplines. So I think we're I think the, the, the key thing that I would say is with climate, with sustainability, and um, with many of these issues, it's a multifaceted um, kind of problem that we're trying to solve. And so it's not surprising that in a, uh, adjacent to, to understanding data and how to, and all those disciplines uh, related to processing it and, and interrogating it, you also need to see integration and uh, an understanding of law, uh, engineering, science, uh, risk management, commercial um, uh, issues, et cetera. And so there's a lot of focus, as I mentioned before, on kind of capacity building, both at the kind of, um, I guess, mid-level managerial level, but also more broadly stepping back, there's a lot of uh, discussion in Asia about, well, actually, do we also need to be training, uh, and this is more than just data, but do we actually need to be training you know, boards and um, uh, senior executives about understanding uh, sustainable finance, ESG, um, risks, prudential regulation, et cetera. So it's a very big focus on uh, capacity and the need for training in, in Asia. Thank you, Matt. Uh, um, Emily, how would you, um how would you see the kind of skills uh, skills kind of mix evolving at, uh, at, uh, at JP Morgan Asset Management? Yeah, I can I could definitely concur with um, you know the fact that I think it's evolved almost. Um, you know, data is still an issue. There are gaps, and you need to make a number of assumptions, especially in the fixed income world where we have um, a lot of non-publicly listed um, companies and, and um, indeed, um, you know, loan pools and, and municipals. Um, so data definitely remains an issue, but I think a lot of um, a lot of data is now available, as Elena pointed out, and it's about how does everyone across the firm sort of learn to digest that. Um, and so we're, we're sort of, um, the way we, we're tackling that is um, by uh, setting up sessions like ESG Lunch and Learns, um, where we'll get external and internal participants to come and share their ESG knowledge so that it becomes a lot more broad 
uh, based and then you can leverage all those different skill sets because I think at the moment it just feels like a very big topic to get your head around and quite a scary one as well for those that also have been in the market for quite a long time and are very familiar with traditional financial metrics um, but still grappling with how, how to take um, the CSG impact in, into consideration. Um, and then the one thing I would just echo as well is just on, um, I think there's just a huge amount of cross um, sort of industry and cross asset partnerships required um, because, you know, ultimately this is an area which really can have this um, cross asset partnership because we're all sort of striving towards the same goal. Um, and so you need to avoid sort of rep duplicate like where possible, um, use an external industry provider to sort of do an education session on um, a particular ESG issue. Um, and similarly with data, you know, really make sure you're sharing across. Um, we're really working on sharing that across all asset classes um, and not, not duplicating efforts and, and trying to avoid asking companies, you know, the same question from mm -hmm. so many different angles, as Kate pointed out earlier on. Mm -hmm. Kate, thank thank you, uh, Emily. Kate, as a, as a kind of perhaps the the, the last uh, uh, comment of the uh, session, you you obviously talk to a lot of asset owners and a lot of asset managers. Um, Emily, hinting perhaps at a, at a kind of change of mindset required amongst asset managers in terms of you know collaboration, bringing in uh, uh, external partners to kind of help on some some, some of these challenges. Is is that? Do you feel that that's uh, necessary? And do do you see it? Um, you know happening quite um, um you know, evidence that it's happening already yeah i think that's right i, I think it's, it's not something that that any one individual firm or investor can, can solve um in their own rights it has to be something that that's yeah we we collaborate on globally and as an industry seek to seek to solve but but i think not just across the industry but also with with academics with um other participants the ngos um uh, we see um for example um the the um, net zero framework that's been developed, the, the, the focus on um, sovereign um, fixed income data and a real focus from uh, a working group there around, yeah, w which metrics might be useful and, and how can we, again, evolve the market. And I think over time we will evolve to, to sort of coalesce around particular measures. And um, we've seen, again, that the sort of industry develop over the last 10 years in terms of the availability of sort of carbon footprinting data on the equity side, we're seeing that on the fixed income side. So um, I think from an asset owner perspective, it is all about the transparency of that data though, and how can they on report to their onward beneficiaries in a, a sort of transparent and, and very clear way. So, so again, it's not just about having data for data's sake, it's how you use and interpret and, and share that data to, to make it meaningful to, to, to sort of end owners, I, I guess, and ultimately the, the beneficiaries. Indeed. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, today, this uh, this morning, this afternoon, for your uh, your contributions to uh, what has turned out to be the um, the probably the most interesting and uh, uh, informative one hour and 10 minutes of your day rather than the uh, one hour we promised you. Um, so thanks to everyone who's uh, uh, who's uh, um, um, can listen and, and, and watch throughout uh, uh, throughout today's session. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, to the panelists. Uh, we very much appreciate your your, your time and uh, expertise. We will uh, we we sadly don't have time to uh, go through some of the uh, questions and answers, but we have received and we're grateful uh, for those. And we will revert uh, with, uh, with with responses uh, um, to to those if, if at all possible. Um, it just now remains for me to kind of to, to say uh, that thank you, Art. thank you very much to everybody, um, and uh, we we hope you have a have a great way, uh, rest of day. Um, and uh, if you have any kind of further questions that you would like to kind of follow up on, um, please use the um, uh, the kind of contacts and addresses that uh, will be um, um, that will show up on, on screen shortly. Thank you very much.